Welcome to another lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. I'm continuing my discussion of Ethereum, diving into a lecture on Ethereum wallets. Uh, just a Creative Commons license and disclaimer. Um, you know, this video is available under Creative Commons. Uh, similarly, um, I'm leveraging some content that Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood created on their GitHub site for their Ethereum book, which is also available under this license. Um, and so these slides, which I built, those materials, the video, everything's covered by the Creative Commons, as well as anything that's based on these materials. Um, and just a reminder, mentions of particular blockchain projects don't count, count as an endorsement. You know, I'm providing this for educational purposes only. All right, so I'm gonna dive into different types of wallets. I'll talk about different standards that Ethereum wallets are based on and so on. Now, at the beginning of this, I wanna make a comment that, um, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about here in regards to Ethereum wallets is very similar to what I talked about when I gave my presentation on Bitcoin wallets. And that's because um, when they were developing Ethereum, obviously they were, they were, you know, the people who were developing Ethereum were people who were heavily involved in Bitcoin. And so they originally were thinking about, well, how can we make things better? And it turns out that the wallets in Bitcoin are pretty good. And so there's not a whole lot of improvements on the Ethereum side. Um, however, we're beginning to see some modifications and updates. Um, but at the basic wallet standard level, the standards are very similar or identical in many cases. Um, and another reason for that has to do with the whole idea of the wallet being essentially your private key, your master private key, and then generating other private keys. And I'll talk about that later. Well, one of the aspects of that is you can use the same master private key to, to hold your Bitcoin as well as to hold your Ethereum. And so you just have one wallet to handle multiple types of cryptocurrency if we're following the same standards. Um, and so that's a benefit of using the same Bitcoin standards in developing your Ethereum wallets. All right, so let's dive into wallets. So a wallet is a software application that serves as your primary user interface to Ethereum. The wallet controls access to a user's money, managing the private keys, public keys, and addresses. The wallet tracks your balance in your account. The wallet enables creating and signing transactions. Um, in addition, you know, you know, wallets can interact with smart contracts, uh, ERC-20 tokens, non-fungible tokens, and so on. Uh, from a programmer's perspective, the word wallet refers to the system used to store and manage a user's public and private keys. Uh, every wallet has a key management component. Uh, for some wallets, that's all they have. Other wallets are part of a much broader category, essentially being a client user interface or a browser, which is an interface to Ethereum-based decentralized applications or dApps that we're going to talk about in a subsequent lecture. So this lecture is going to all be all about how do our wallets manage our private and public keys and addresses. So one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Ethereum wallets don't actually contain the Ethereum or the tokens. Uh, strictly speaking, the wallet has your keys. Um, the Ethereum, the Ether or other tokens are recorded on the Ethereum blockchain. And so your wallet is essentially using your keys to look up what assets you own on the blockchain. And then it displays those uh, to the user through the graphic user interface. Just like a web browser, if it goes to a popular website, will display what that website uh, what this, uh, has on its web page when it downloads the web page to display it to the user. So users control the tokens on the network by signing transactions with the keys in their wallets. So in a sense, an Ethereum wallet is a keychain of the keys that control your assets that you hold in Ethereum. Now keep in mind that the keys held by the wallet are the only things that are needed to transfer Ether or tokens to others. Um, but you want to have... Um, change your mindset from sort of the centralized system of conventional banking, where only you and the bank can see the money in your account, um, to the decentralized system where everyone can see the balance of an account. Although they may not know who owns the account and everyone needs to be convinced that you're the owner to move funds in a transaction. And for that, we're using your digital keys to sign your transactions.
Um, so one thing to think about, though, is that, um, you know, wallets are a balance of convenience and privacy. Uh, the most convenient Ethereum wallet is one with a single private key and address that you use for everything. That's convenient, but there isn't any privacy. So typically nowadays, uh, people might use a new key for every transaction. That's best for privacy, but it's difficult to manage. And so good wallet design is important to be able to manage the complexities of having different keys for different transactions. Now, there are several different types of wallets. The first type of wallet that we'll talk about is a non-deterministic wallet, where each key is independently generated from a different random number. The keys are not related to each other. Uh, this type of wallet can also be referred to as a JBOC wallet or just a bunch of keys wallet. Um, the second type of wallet is a deterministic wallet, where all the keys are derived from a single master private key, sometimes referred to as a seed. Uh, all the keys in this type of wallet are related to each other and can be generated again as long as you have the original seed. Um, there are a number of different key derivation methods that we'll talk about. Uh, the most commonly used derivation method is a tree-like structure uh, described in some of the Bitcoin and Prima proposals uh, as the hierarchical deterministic wallet. Uh, So before we dive any further into that, um, you know, most major wallets that people are using these days are the deterministic wallets, not the non-deterministic wallets. Um, and generally, for example, how you know you're using a deterministic wallet is if you when you install the wallet, um, you generated a seed. And usually these seeds are um, a list of monomic code words. Um, you know, like a dozen words or 24 words you can use to regenerate all the keys that are associated with that wallet. Um, and so, um, you know, if you've got that recovery word, word list, you know that the wallet you created is one of these deterministic wallets where all your keys are derived from that single master key, which is based on those words. So let's talk a little bit more about these non-deterministic random wallets before we dive into the details about how the deterministic wallets work. Um, so the non-deterministic random wallets were the very first wallets created. Um, you know, in the very first Ethereum wallet uh, produced for the Ethereum presale, each wallet file stored a single randomly generated private key. Those wallets um, are obviously being replaced with deterministic wallets because the old style just a box, bunch of keys wallets are in many ways inferior. Uh, for example, it's considered a best practice to avoid Ethereum address reuse as a part of maximizing your privacy while using Ethereum. That is, use a new address, which needs a new private key, every time you receive funds. You could go further and use a new address every time you have a transaction, although that can get expensive if you deal with a lot of tokens. So to follow this practice, a non-deterministic wallet will need to regularly increase its list of keys, which, which means you'll need to make regular backups. Um, if you would ever lose your data, disk failure, uh, accidents, lost machine, uh, before you manage to back up your wallet, you could lose access to your funds. Um, so the original non-deterministic wallets were hard to deal with because they create a new wallet file for every new address. Um, Uh, some Ethereum clients use a key store file, which is a JSON encoded file that contains a single randomly generated private key encrypted by a passphrase. Um, the key store file uses a key derivation function, which is a password stretching algorithm to protect against brute force and rainbow table attacks uh, and dictionary attacks. Um, and there's a variety of software libraries that support this. However, again, these non-deterministic wallets are cumbersome to use, and we discourage them from being used for anything other than testing. Instead, uh, the, the, the best practice is to use an industry standard-based hierarchical deterministic wallet with a monomic seed for backup. So let's explain what these deterministic wallets are. 
So a deterministic or a seeded wallet is a wallet that contains private keys that are derived from a single master key or seed. The seed is a randomly generate, generated number, you know, uh, that is combined, with, as we talked about in the previous lecture, that is uh, combined with other data, such as an index number or chain code, to derive any number of private keys. In a deterministic wallet, the seed is sufficient to recover all the derived keys. And therefore, a single backup at creation time is sufficient to secure all the funds and smart contracts in the wallet. The seed is also sufficient for a wallet export or import, allowing for easy migration of the keys between different wallet implementations. The design makes the security of the seed uh, of utmost importance, as only the seed is needed to gain access to the entire wallet. On the other hand, being able to focus security efforts on a single piece of data can be seen as an advantage. So these Heracle deterministic wallets are based on some Bitcoin standards, BIP32 and BIP44. Uh, deterministic wallets were designed to make it easy to drive many keys from a single seed. Currently, the most advanced form of deterministic wallet is the Heracle deterministic wallet, which is defined by the Bitcoin standards uh, BIP32. Uh, HD wallets contain keys derived in a tree structure, such that a parent key can derive a sequence of child keys, each of which can derive a sequence of grandchild keys, and so on. Um, here's an example of our tree of keys. So use your, your seed to generate the master key. Then the master key can generate child keys, and each of the child keys can generate grandchildren keys. Now, you might ask yourself, well, why do I need, you know, four layers of child keys and then another each child key having another four layers well actually this could be any number of keys um but for example like one child key to the master key might be your bitcoin child key another one might be an ethereum child key another one might be you know yet net, yet another token so each token could have its own child key and then each of the tokens might have grandchildren for various purposes Or you might organize the tree as by by industry or another approach. There's a number of different ways you could you can organize your tree of keys from that single seed. So Heracle deterministic wallets offer several advantages over simple uh, deterministic wallets. You know, the tree structure can be used to express organizational meaning or types of key payments. Um, you can also do something where you can create a sequence of public keys without uh, exposing your private keys. So for example, you could have a web server that is creating your public keys uh, for people to send you payments while all the private key uh, uh, creation is done in a more secure server. Um, and that's uh, pretty, you know, pretty interesting for web stores and things like that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's talk about how the seeds and monomic codes work. And this was part of the Bitcoin standards for BIP39. So there's a number of different ways to encode a private key for secure backup and retrieval. Uh, the currently preferred method is using a sequence of words that when uh, in the correct order, can uniquely recreate the private key. And this is sometimes referred to as a monomic, and the approach is standardized in BIP39. Uh, many Ethereum wallets and wallets for other cryptocurrencies also use this Bitcoin standard and can import and export seeds for backup and recovery using interoperable monomics. So um, let's talk about how this works. So for example, if we were to look at a seed in hexadecimal, that seed might be um, FCC F1 A B 3329 FD, you know, this really long number here. Uh, again, this is hexadecimal, so it's zero to nine and A through F. So that gives you, you know, a fairly large number. To and if you get any one of these digits out of order or you get the wrong number or letter, you create a different seed. So if we wanna back this up, it'd be better to have something that's more readable than this. Um, and this is our 12 word monomic that generates that, which is identical to this seed here, but it's a lot more easier to read. It's 12 words, wolf, juice, proud, gown, wool, unfair, wall, cliff, insect, more, detail, and hub. Um, now these 12 words are actually selected from a pool of about 2000 words. 
Um, and those words in that pool were selected because the, none of those words are very similar. So for example, wolf and wall are close in that they both have a W and an L in the third, they have a W in the first character and L in the third character, but the middle, second character is different and the fourth character is different. So all the words in this pool of words that they're selected from have multiple letters that are different. You know, here's wool, um, W-O-O. -O. Again, it's got uh, the first two characters are different, but the third character and the fourth character are different from wolf. Um, and wool has two characters different from wall. And if you were to look at the whole pool, you would see that all the words have at least two characters different to make it hard to confuse the words. And so long as you have them in the right order and you, you haven't confused the words, multiple characters in the word, m multiple typos in a word, you should be pretty good on recovering your original seed. So um, in practical terms though, if you were to write down this deterministic wallet, uh, there's high odds that you'll get something wrong. Whereas this list of words, it's very small. The odds are that you'd get something wrong. So, um, and always you want to write down your backup, uh, you know, because obviously no one wants to memorize a seed, um, but you want to avoid digital backups. You don't want to store it in a file. You don't want to take a photograph of it. Uh, your backup should be, uh, you know, on paper, you know, somewhere where it's safe. So as cryptocurrency wallet technology has matured, uh, there's been a number of common industry standards that emerged to make wallets interoperable, easy to use, secure, and flexible. And these standards allow wallets to uh, generate keys from multiple different cryptocurrencies, all from a single monomic um, seed. So these common standards, again, are based on the Bitcoin standards. So the monomic code word standard, BIP39, the HD wallet standard, uh, BIP32, uh, the multi-purpose HD wallet structure, BIP43. So, you know, we could have one child being of the, in the tree hierarchy being for Bitcoin, another child being for Ethereum, uh, and the multi-currency and multi-account wallets based on BIP44. Again, you know, ha handling multiple currencies and multiple accounts. Uh, these standards can change. They can be uh, modified by future developments, um, but they've been adopted by a broad range of software and hardware wallets. Uh, so, for example, MetaMask, uh, JAX, MyCrypto, MyEther Wallet, and so on support these standards, including uh, hardware wallets like Keep, Keep Key, Ledger, and Trezor, uh, and so on. Um, here's an example of what a Trezor hardware device looks like. It's uh, a simple USB device with some buttons that stores keys in the forms of an HD wallet, and you can use it to sign transactions for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. And it implements the various standards we just talked about. Uh, here's a look at what it would look like when you're writing down that monomic seed. Uh, when you use your Trezor, it's going to generate a random number, um, and then um, it's going to use that random number to create the seed. Um, and so the seed is going to be that list of words. And as you're look, working with this treasure, it's got this little screen here. And you'd be pressing the buttons to move through the list of 12 words. It would say, hey, write down word seven as garbage. And then it'll go write down word eight and so on. Um, and then you write down your list. And that gives you a backup list for recovering if you lose your wallet um, or you want to you know, migrate to another wallet on another device. Uh, here's a look at um, a 12 word uh, backup that someone wrote down. Uh, in this case, it's one through 12 and it's army van defense, carry gels true, garbage claim, echo media making crunch. And it's important to have it in numerical order. Um, and so just to make sure there's no confusion as to whether you're doing rows first or columns first, we've got the number right next to the word. You know, number one is army, number seven is garbage. It's not number two is garbage. Uh, and it doesn't have to be 12 words, it can be 24 words. Uh, it's really up to the various wallet how many words they want. Um, in theory, the 24 words might be more secure than 12 words, but it's, it's, it's pretty marginal. Um, so the monomic code words that I mentioned, there, there are these word sequences that encode a random number used as a seed to derive a deterministic wallet. The sequence of words is sufficient to recreate the seed and from there recreate the wallet and all the derived keys. So a wallet application that implements deterministic wallets is will show the user the sequence of 12 to 24 words when first creating the wallet. 
Uh, that sequence of words is a wallet backup. It can be used to recover and recreate all the keys in the same or compatible wallet. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the monomic words makes it easier to back up the wallets because they're easy to read and correctly transcribe. Um, I showed uh, a, a couple of uh, earlier lectures where I had wallets recover um, using these word uh, lists. Um, and basically, you know, when you're installing your wallet, you'll get an option. Do you want to generate a new seed or do you want to recover from a previous seed? And, you know, and that's the process where, you know, depending on what choice you make there, you'll either generate a new seed and then you write the words down or it'll ask you, hey, you're recovering from an, an old seed. Well, then give me what the words are that you want to recover from. Uh, sometimes monomic words are confused with brain wallets. Uh, they're not the same. A brain wallet is words that are chosen by a user where monomics are created randomly. So that's a pretty big difference. Um, and brain wallets tend to suggest that the words have to be memorized like a password. And that's, that's a bad idea. Um, so um, the, BIP, the English version of the BIP39 word list can be found here on GitHub at github.com, Bitcoin, BIPs, uh, dot, 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 English text. Uh, as I mentioned before, at the most, there should only be a few words that are letters that are in common, and there should be several differences. For example, about and above have the first three letters are the same, but then the last couple word letters are different. Um, so a single letter typo um, should not result in any confusion as to what the word is. Um, and they're generated automatically by the wallet using that standardized process. So let's talk about how they're generated. Um, it actually uh, goes through a series of steps. Um, the words are generated uh, randomly. We start from a source of randomness. Then we add a checksum, and then we map that uh, the result to a word list. So step one is you create a, ra a cryptographically random sequence. Um, of somewhere between 128 to 256 bits, depending on how many words you want to have then, and how much uh, randomness you want to have. Then you create a checksum S by taking the first length of S, dividing it into 32 bits of the SHA-256 hash of S. Uh, then we're going to add the checksum to the end of our random sequence S. Um, then we're going to divide the sequence and checksum into sections of 11 bits. Then we're going to take each of those sections of 11 bits and we'll map it into one of our words from our dictionary of 2000 words. Um, and then we'll create our code, monomic code of the dozen words in order. Um, so let's take a look at this in a diagrammic form. So the first step is we create a random number. In this case, I'm doing 12 words. So it's only gonna be 128 bits of randomness. Um, then I'm gonna take a SHA-256 hash of that a uh, random number and the first four bits of that hash i don't care about the rest of the bits but the first four bits will become my checksum which i'll append to the random number so now i've got a 132 bit random on uh, 132 bit number of which 128 is random and four bits is just checksum at the end then i'm going to take that 132 divide it into 12 segments and so that'll be 12 segments of 11 bits each and each of those 11-bit uh, segments gets mapped into a word like army and van and carry and so on. Um, and so that becomes my 12-word list, which maps back into this number, my random number followed by my checksum of four bits. The checksum is there in case that um, I get uh, in case I get a uh, typo somewhere in my number, I can do a check and verify that, um, you know, there was a typo and we can correct it, hopefully. All right, so, and here's a look at, you know, the, the, the number of words you would need based on how much randomness you want. If you want 256 bits of randomness, you need 24 words. In between 128 to 256, you're going to get somewhere between 15 and 21 words. Uh, basically, uh, the amount of randomness, based on the randomness, your checksum bits may have to increase. And so then your total bits increase a little bit too. Now, once we have our monomic words that represent uh, 
this random number. Now what we're going to do is we're going to build a deterministic wallet. Um, but before we do that, uh, we're actually going to generate the seed because the seed is not that 128 bit random number followed by the four checks four bit checksum. Instead, we're going to use something called a key stretching function, um, which is a and the purpose of the key stretching function is to make it a little more difficult to build a lookup table uh, because, you know, against protecting against hackers who are trying to brute force attack. Um, and so we combine our monomic with uh, what's referred to as assault. And the salt also allows us to add in a password that's an additional security factor protecting the seed. So if you were installing, again, going back to the process you go through when you install that wallet, whether it's MetaMask or another wallet, um, right after they talk about the seed, the next thing they do is ask you if you want to have an optional password. And so that optional password that you're asked about is the salt we're talking about here. And so the salt uh, does two purposes. First, the password is a uh, additional security factor protecting the seed, uh, and it's also used as part of the key stretching function. So, and let's, this, it actually uses as part of it an HMAC. So let's explain what an HMAC is. So an HMAC, and in particular, we use an HMAC called SHA-5, an HMAC based on SHA-512, is a specific type of message authentication code involving a cryptographic hash function and a secret key. As with other message authentication codes, it can be used to verify both the data integrity and the authentic authentication of a message. So HMAC provides message authentication using a shared secret instead of using digital signatures. Uh, and essentially, it's an iterative hashing function that breaks up a message into blocks of fixed size and iterates over them with a compression function. Um, and so it doesn't really encrypt the message. Instead, the message is sent alongside the hash and then parties with the secret key will hash the message again themselves and then uh, check to see if the received and computed hashes match. So this password-based uh, key derivation function, P BKDF2 is a key derivation function with a sliding computational cost that is used to reduce vulnerabilities of brute force attacks. It essentially applies a pseudo random function. In this case, it's using this HMAC SHA-512 I just described to the input password or passphrase along with a salt value and repeats the process many times to produce a derived key, which can be used as a cryptographic key in subsequent operations. Uh, the added computational work makes password cracking by hackers much more difficult. And this is referred to as key stretching. So essentially what you do is you are, your derived key is generated by this PPKDF2 function, which takes several parameters. It takes the HMAC we're using, in this case, HMAC SHA-512, takes your password, takes your salt, number of iterations, and the length of the key that you're trying to derive. So basically, to go from our monomic to the seed, uh, we start off with a random number somewhere between 128 to 256 bits. We want to come up with a key that's 512 bits. So we're using this PKB, this PBKDF2 function to generate that 512-bit uh, seed from this 128 to 256 bit random number we, we put in. Once we've generated it using our key stretching function, we then use that seed to build our deterministic wallet and generate all of our keys. And so this key stretching function essentially takes these two parameters, our monomic and the salt, which is our password. And that salt, as I said, makes it more difficult to uh, build a lookup table enabling a brute force attack. And it also serves as a passphrase. So here's a, a look at how this is done diagrammically. Uh, so the first parameter to our, our key stretching function is a monomic, you know, all those 12 words, which is essentially your random number plus your, um, your digest uh, confirming you didn't have any errors. And then we've got our salt, which is our optional password. And then what we're doing is we're passing the, the code words and the salt uh, into our key stretching function and it runs it a whole bunch of times. Um, and our final output is our seed. Now this is a deterministic algorithm. So if you center in the same 12 words and the same password, you're always gonna get the same output for the seed, which allows us to 
recover wallets if you lose your wallet so long as you have your list of 12 words and your password if you used one. All right, so let's talk about this optional passphrase in a little more detail. So the BIP39 standard allows the use of an optional passphrase in the derivation of the seed. If no passphrase is used, a monomic is stretched with its salt consisting of the constant string monomic producing a specific 512-bit seed from any given monomic. If a passphrase is used, a stretching function can produce a different seed from the same monomic. So, um, Every possible passphrase will, for a particular uh, monomic will lead to a different seed. Now, essentially, there is no wrong passphrase. All passphrases are valid, even have not having a passphrase at all. They all lead to different seeds, forming a vast set of possible wallets. Uh, and there's no practical possibility of brute forcing or accidentally getting one that's in use as long as the passphrase has sufficient complexity and length. Uh, there are two important features to the passphrase. You know, a second factor that makes the monomic useless on its own protects uh, monomic backups from compromise by a thief. Also provides a form of, you know, plausible deniability uh, in that uh, you could have one passphrase that leads to all a small amount of cryptocurrency and another passphrase leads to the real wallet that contains the majority of the funds. However, it's important to note that the use of a passphrase also introduces the risk of loss. If the wallet owner is incapacitated or dead and no one else knows the passphrase, the seed's useless and all the funds stored in the wallet are lost forever. Conversely, if the owner backs up the passphrase in the same place as the seed, it defeats the purpose of having a second factor. While passphrases are very useful, they should only be used in combination with a carefully planned process for backups and recovery. Consider the possibility of errors, surviving the owner being able to recover the current cryptocurrency. Um, again, here's a look at um, a 128 bits of randomness with no passphrase. We've got our 128 bits of randomness. Here's your words, no passphrase, and here's the seed that is generated. Here's a look at, uh, again, randomness, but now we've got a passphrase, super duper secret. And you can see the seed is very different. This one was 5B5, this one starts as 3B5, all right? Um, and then more randomness, 256 bits. Now we have 24 words, no passphrase. We've got 3269. Um, as I mentioned, you know, optional passphrases have some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, they do make it more secure, but you got to make sure you don't lose a passphrase. And if you put the passphrase in the same place you put the list, you're not really adding any security. Um, BIP39 is implemented as a library in many different uh, programming languages, you know, Python, C, Ethereum, JavaScript, you name it. Uh, there are BIP39 generators, like here's one that you can use on online. Uh, working with a code converter, you know, checking out how it works. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, creating an HD wall for the seed. So these Heracle deterministic walls can be created from a single root seed, which is a 128, 256, or 512 bit random number. Most commonly, the seed is ge generated from a nomic, as we discussed. So every key in the HD wallet is deterministically derived from the root seed, which makes it possible to create the entire HD wallet from that seed in any compatible HD wallet. It makes it easy to export, backup, restore, and import HD wallets containing thousands or even millions of keys by just transferring that list of words that we talked about. Most HD wallets are gonna follow the BIP32 standard, which is a de facto industry standard for deterministic key generation. Um, main important aspect of BIP32 is the tree-like hierarchical relationships and, it, and that it's possible for the derived keys to have. Um, and there are dozens of different implementations of BIP32 offered in many different software libraries in Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. So keys can be extended. Uh, with the right mathematical operations, these extended keys can be used to derive child keys, 
thus producing the hierarchy of keys and addresses that we talked about. Uh, a parent key doesn't have to be at the top of the tree. It can be picked out from anywhere in the tree hierarchy. Extending a key involves taking the key and appending a special chain code to it. A chain code is a 256-bit binary string that is mixed with each key to produce the child keys. So here we see a diagram showing uh, going from the root seed to the master keys and the chain code. So again, we've got our cryptographically random number, secure random number. We have our code words, army, van, defense, and so on based on that random number. You came up with a root seed for your wallet, which was 128, 26, or 512 bits. Um, and the way we did that was we use this, uh, then we're gonna use a uh, HMAC SHA-512 to take our root seed and we'll have a 512 bits output and 256 bits of that becomes our master private key and the other 256 bits of that becomes our master chain code and then we create our public key from our private key using the process we had talked about before of how you go from a private key to a public key using an elliptic curve cryptography Um, here's a look at how we would go from a parent private key to a child private key. So I've got a parent private key over here. Um, and my parent private key is used to generate my parent public key. And I also have this chain code associated with my parent. And I have an index number as to what key I want to create. You know, for example, I want to create um, child zero or child one or child two. So my inputs in HMAC SHI 512 would be the parent public key in the chain code and the index number for the child I'm creating. And then I would also have, and this would produce a 512 bits output, 2v6 of which is gonna be an input for creating my private key and 2v6 bits, which is gonna be for creating my chain code. And then once we've created the private key for the child, we can then create the child public key. So that's how a parent private key generates a, a child private key. Um, so. Now extended pu private keys and public keys can be distinguished by the prefix uh, extended, XPRV and XPublish uh, for an extended public key. So a very useful characteristic of hierarchical deterministic wallets is the ability to derive child public keys from the parent public keys without having the private keys involved at all. You know, I just showed you an example where we had the private keys involved in generating the public and private keys. Well, what if we could just generate the public keys without having the private keys involved? Well, this would give us, first off, this would give us two different ways of deriving a public key. We could either do it the way I just showed you directly from the child private key, or from the parent's public key. And so extended public keys can be used to derive all the public keys in that branch of the HD wallet structure. And that way we can do public key only deployments where you, for example, have an e-commerce application that is generating public keys for, for to create addresses uh, to receive cryptocurrency, but the private key isn't stored on the website and therefore the private key is not in danger of being hacked. So here's an example of how you would do that. Uh, again, we're using our chain code and our public key, but the private key is not involved at all this time. We just have our parent public key, our parent chain code, and the index number again as to what child you wanna create. All that goes into HMAX SHA-512, and then the output's gonna be uh, 256 bits for the child public key, and then 256 bits for the child chain code. Um, now you may wonder, okay, I'm sending 256 bits from the child uh, here. My child public key is 264 bits. Where are these other eight bits coming from? Actually coming from the parent public key up here. That's where they're coming from. Um, so the ability to arrive a branch of public keys from an extended public key or an XPUB is very useful, but it comes with potential risk. Because the XPUB contains a chain code used to derive child public keys from the parent public key, if a child private key is known or somehow leaked it can be used with the chain code to derive all the other child private keys. So a single linked child private key together with a parent chain code reveals all the private keys of all the children. Worse, the child private key together with the parent chain code can be used to deduce the parent private key. 
So let's go over what we're talking about for vulnerability. Um, our worry is the chain code. If the chain code uh, was on the web server, we needed to put the, the chain code up on the web server so that we could derive these child public keys. Well, if that chain code is uh, known, and if somewhere at some point someone got a hold of one of these child private keys, they could use the chain code along with the private keys to figure out more stuff. And in fact, uh, they might even be able to go backwards and figure out the parent's private key. So HD wallets use a um, can use an alternative derivation function called hardened der derivation, which will break the relationship between parent public key and child chain code. Um, so a single so to counter that risk of that leak, uh, we can do this hardened derivation approach. And this will essentially create a firewall in the parent-child sequence with a chain code that can't be used to compromise a parent or sibling private key. So in simple terms, if you wanna use the convenience of an XPUB to derive branches of public keys without exposing yourself to the risk of leaked chain code, you should derive it from one of these hardened parents rather than a normal parent. Uh, the best practice is to have the level one children of the master keys always derived by hidden derivation to prevent compromise of the master keys. So here we show our hardened derivation. We've got our parent private key chain code and index number. Uh, and I don't have the public key involved up here. Instead, the parent private key is going directly into HMAC. Uh, and then we're generating our child private key and the public key. And there's our child chain code. So it's desirable to be able to derive more than one child key from a given parent key. Uh, to manage this, an index number is used um, and each index number when combined with the parent key using the special child derivation function gives a different child key. And so the index number is essentially a 32-bit integer. Um, And the index numbers are a little different depending on whether you're doing normal derivation versus hardened derivation. Um, keys in an HD wallet are typically identified using a path naming convention you know, using slashes. Um, normally, you're not ever gonna have to deal with this if you are just a user of wallets, but if you're actually writing software to interact with a wallet, you might ha uh, have to deal with this notation uh, where you know you can actually identify the keys using slashes, and identify what level of the tree you're in, and you know how 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 far you are down, and the index number of the key you're looking for. Um, and here's some path examples. Again, most people are never gonna have to deal with this. You'll be you'll have a much nicer user interface uh, for your wallet. But if you are writing your own wallet, you might have to deal with uh, how to describe the HD wallet path. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is that this is a very flexible structure, but it can potentially support lots and lots of keys through this flexible structure. Each parent can have 4 billion children, 2 billion normal children and 2 billion of these hardened children. And each of those keys can have another 4 billion children. So you can have a very large tree. So how does your data structure in your wallet actually deal with all these potential keys? That's actually a problem. Um, so for most users, it's not gonna be a, a big problem, but if you generate a lot of addresses that don't, that are never used, this could actually become a problem for you. So just keep it in mind that if you generate a lot of addresses that are never used, you should double check exactly what's going on in your wallet. Uh, BIP43 proposes the use of the first hardened child index as a special identifier, signifies the purpose of the tree structure. So, uh, BIP44 is, uh, gives you a lot of support for multi-currencies and multiple accounts. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the path levels, but it basically describes how to handle like Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, Bitcoin, Testnet, and so on. 
up. And again, as a user, you're never going to see this. You'll have a graphic user interface on your wallet. This is only if you're doing programming at the wallet level and you need to understand exactly what's going on uh, in, in your wallet. Um, here's a look at how to interpret um, you know, the different types of keys in your wallet. So in summary, wallets are the foundation of any user-facing blockchain application. They allow users to manage collections of keys and addresses. Wallets also allow users to demonstrate their ownership of Ether and authorized transactions by applying digital signatures. Wallets can be non-deterministic or deterministic. Uh, non-deterministic wallets are collections of random keys. These become difficult to manage as the numbers of keys grows. Uh, deterministic wallets have all the keys derived from a single seed and are easier to manage. HD wallets uh, arrange keys in a key structure that are arrivable using a common seed. Uh, these monomic code words are a great way to describe a seed with better human readability. And there's a number of other standards that give you uh, propositions for allocating the different branches of the tree structure uh, for multi purposes and multiple accounts and so on, multiple currencies. So thank you for watching this short little video on Ethereum wallets, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Uh, tune in next time. We're going to dive in deeper into Ethereum.